name is Stacy Sprout, and I'm a licensed independent clinical social worker in Seattle, Washington, in practice. I graduated from the University of Washington in 1994 in a concentration of health and mental health, and I've worked in those fields for over 20 years. And I currently, for the last decade, have been focusing on helping people who are survivors of trauma who have developed addictions and supporting them in their healing journey. Now, I have an afternoon session that is about extreme trauma and addiction, so if you're interested in that topic, there'll be much more depth in this afternoon. Today, the topic is Extreme Abuse 101. Oh, I also wrote and published a memoir of my own recovery journey of healing from trauma and addictions, which is for sale out in the lobby, and it's available on Amazon.com. There's my promo. Mm -hmm. uh, I am also a survivor of extreme abuse. And while that's not the primary focus of my memoir, it has been the primary focus of my life in terms of healing. And one of the things I realized on my healing journey is that there's very, there's a lot of information out there, but it's very difficult to get in a clear, focused, concise, and non-sensationalized way. And that was an impediment to my healing. And so I wanted to create something that had those qualities, and that's why this is going to be here for you today. Now, I'm passionate about this topic, but I know it's not an easy one. So please take care of yourself. And if that means taking a walk, leaving, coming back, saying, I think I'll check out the video later, please do that. I will not be offended. I will not, I will not focus on you if you need to step out. Just take care of yourself, and I will trust that. And I will thank you for doing that. So this has a dual focus. I'm going to talk about extreme abuse, I'm going to give definitions and some history of the concept, and I'm also going to be talking about why these topics are so difficult to learn about. And that involves talking about the human response to horror and how the nervous system works so that we can combine those together so that you'll have, hopefully, the best information you have for how to become more knowledgeable about what extreme abuse is. People in the audience are variety and who will be watching this video in terms of backgrounds. That includes survivors of extreme abuse, helping professionals like therapists or other uh, body workers who work with people who may be having memories or processing their pain around these issues. We also have people interested from the criminal justice system, law enforcement, child protective agencies, other victims advocates. So if there's a lot of people in the community who are interested in what this means and they're using it uh, to the benefit of their practices. So welcome, everyone. And there's family members here also. Uh, so I'll be taking some breaks as we go through, just so you know, and those will be invitations for me to ground and calm down. I'm excited. And also for you too. Uh, so, this specific class, some years ago, I, I, uh, the inspiration started to point in a big arrow toward it because the symptoms that I was having based on my own body memories of what had happened to me were so strong that I could not deny how extreme the things that I went through were. And I don't mean to minimize any abuse of a child or anyone by focusing only on one end of the continuum. But for me, I was looking for what, what, I was overwhelmed with shock, but also as the shock was starting to ebb away and I was accepting the reality, I started to get into rage. And anyone who studied the stages of grief knows that there's the shock stage and then there's the anger stage. And while it's not perfectly linear, I hit a place in my recovery where I was enraged. And I knew that if I did not find a way to process my rage, it was going to really hamper my life and my relationships. So I took nine days off, I was working as a therapist at that time, and I now look back on this as my rage-cation, and I recommend it, but, especially for your family and friends. Um, I got together with two other survivors of extreme abuse that I'd met through survivor networking, and we went to movies, we saw plays, we talked, we cooked, and I also took solitude, and I journaled, I did Skype therapy, and I just really meditated and prayed about what was happening to me and how could I turn this rage into something positive because really I felt quite violent and I also self-destructive and so that was part of my prayer and during that time I happened to see a movie and the movie was called 
Watchers of the Sky. Anyone here see the movie? It's not widely known, but it was a film festival that I saw it at. And Watchers of the Sky is a movie about a man named uh, Raphael Lemkin. He's a Polish Jew who lost 47 members of his family when Hitler's army invaded Poland. And he saw firsthand the universal capacity for humans to do harm of great magnitude to one another. But when this happened during World War II, there was no word for what he saw. And Lemkin knew that if he could make up a word, it might increase other people's understanding of what he had went through and so many of his people in his country went through. And so he made up a word. And if you've seen this before, don't, don't, don't blurt it out for my family and friends in the room, but uh, does anybody know the word that he made up? Okay. The word is genocide. Now, we know what genocide means. I think most people accept what genocide means. But at that time, there was no word. So he inspired me to try to better define the concept of extreme abuse in the same way that the word genocide captures something beyond the simple crime of murder. So there are many kinds of genocides that have occurred throughout history. And it wasn't until he brought this forth that there was something that was created called the Genocide Convention. And the, the coining the term led to the prosecution of perpetrators of the Holocaust at the Nuremberg Trials. And the United Nations then defined the crime of genocide under international law. And Lemkin, how many years do you think it took him to try to bring this word forth to the UN and talk with people? It took him 18 years. So I thought, well, OK. I'm angry at what happened to me. Here's a man who saw 47 people murdered and many more at the Holocaust. And he hung in there and tried to make a difference for 18 years. So OK, I'll work on this presentation and put something out there and see if I can be a benefit in this movement of more understanding. So I'm not the first person to use the term extreme abuse. It came about, I first heard it in 2010, an activist a survivor of extreme abuse and author Kathleen Sullivan told me about it at a conference I went to in Connecticut and she was starting an organization. But that was uh, not the first time. In fact, the first time it had been used in research was something called the Extreme Abuse Survey. This was a survey done by four amazing researchers, Carol Rutz, Thordston Becker, Wanda Carriger, and Bettina Overcamp. And they presented on this at the International Society of the Study of Trauma and Dissociation Conference in 2008. So they had had the uh, research. It was an online survey. They asked 248 questions about a wide range of types of abuse. And they, tr they were well networked with therapists. So they sent this out to therapists and they said, tell your clients if they want to participate to, to you know, go online and, and do this survey. So many clients did. I actually did. Uh, and how many people did they get back? Well, they got 1,471 participants from over 30 countries. So they had a global response. And it was powerful. And they defined four categories of abuse in their survey. So again, when we're talking about abuse, there's a whole continuum. We are looking at one end of it. That's what we'll be talking about today. In their survey, how they qualify the idea of extreme abuse is ritual abuse, mind control, ritual abuse and mind control in combination, or they had an other category where they did, they wrote uh, questions about things like incest, uh, but they did not involve ritualized issues or mind control. So how, what, what do these terms mean? You may, excuse me, get some water here. You may have heard of them, you may not, but what do they mean? Well, what they said, actually the ritual abuse definition uh, comes from Susan Kelly in a paper she wrote in 1988, but it, it refers to what they were asking about the kinds of questions. Repeated, systematic, psychological, spiritual, physical, and sexual abuse, what we typically think of, of of child abuse, combined with the use of ceremonies, rituals, and symbols, usually perpetrated in and by a group. So, uh, so that's how they define ritual abuse. Now, of the people who affirmed child sexual abuse or various kinds of abuse, 19% of those affirmed the kinds of questions that had specific uh, indicators of ritual abuse. 
Mind control, only 7% were solely mind control. What's that? These are specific procedures designed to make a victim follow directions of the programmer without conscious awareness of what they're doing. Now, I'm going to explain that in more detail later. But that's the question aimed at mind control. Only 7% only have that. But, as you can see, there's a tremendous overlap of the two categories. So, in and of groups who are organized in ritual abuse, there's often a connection. So, it's good to know if you're a provider or a victim's advocate or you're doing a prosecution out there, if you're seeing one, it's good to know about the other one so you can take a look. So, combination, and then the other category of abuse was 22%. One of the conclusions that was stated at the Trauma and Dissociation Conference was that uh, RAMC, which is a shorthand for Ritual Abuse Mind Control, is a global phenomenon. But the majority of responders in the survey were from the United States. So we kind of, sometimes we think, about, oh, that happens somewhere else. But according to this survey, and again, they were from the U.S., so that's where their best network. But the bottom line is there were plenty of people from the U.S. that responded to this. So, why haven't you heard about the survey very much? Why didn't this become national news? Well, you probably have some intuitive answers. This is a question that comes to the heart of all of us. To see, to hear, to feel. And guess what? It hurts. It hurts right now. I feel pain just talking about it. I would rather be talking about the Seahawks. <laughs> but uh, it becomes a question of safety and I have come to believe that it's safer to know about extreme abuse than not to know but at a pace that does not overwhelm us so that becomes my task today how can I present this content to you you may already be overwhelmed the idea of ritual abuse mind control ugh. so Yet, it's happening. So, let's talk about it. That's how I feel. But again, take care of yourself and pace yourself if you're watching the video. Keep your hand on the pause button if you need it. But let's go forward. So, how do we learn about the horrific without becoming horrified ourselves? Well, we can't. It's horrible. But we can learn about the horrific, hopefully, without becoming traumatized, which is kind of like stuck in the world. This is an ad for Mercedes-Benz, but I love the picture of the left brain and the right brain because it's just beautiful. And, you know, the, just the summary is the left brain is the logic and the right brain is the emotion. That's an oversimplification, but in general. So how can we learn about the horrific without becoming traumatized? Well, I'm going to give you a few strategies. Number one, you're here because you want to be here. You're here voluntarily. You're studying this because you care about it for some reason. So no one is forcing you or trapping you into this knowledge. Now that may not have been the case in abuse if you're an abuse survivor, but it is the case now. You can leave or stop this at any time. Number two, we use logic. We use the brilliance of the left brain to balance out the horror of the right brain so that they can work together. Like Marsha Linehan of DBT therapy talks about the wise mind. We want to tap into the strength of the wise mind, where we feel with our heart, and we know with our mind, we come together at the center. We also try to learn from credible sources, and that's one of the biggest things I've tried about today, is to just use AP stories, mainstream news articles, just use things that are not, you know, uh, fringe sites, although there's good information on fringe sites, let me tell you. But it's, especially if you're learning 101, you, you know, I'll talk about the threat response and what it does to try to cope with pain, but sticking with credible sources kind of balances out the, the natural like denial response uh, or can help with that. And lastly, we remind ourselves that we have a noble purpose for learning about extreme abuse. So this isn't just a walk in the park, but we're doing it for a reason. So we can try to affirm our courage for being here and going through some pain and horror. So that's the wise mind. I call it whole brain learning. And that's the way to metabolize something that is so disturbing. <coughs> what is our purpose? Well, we want to expand our minds and hearts to better understand our world and serve our clients and our communities. That is a noble purpose. So back to the difficulty of metabolizing horror. 
one of the things that's challenged if we really open up to the fact that this is existing on a wider scale is that we each have an understanding of attachment with the world community, and this kind of content threatens it. Is the world safe or not? Can we be secure in a world that has large quantities of people who are perpetrating extreme abuse in it? So we have to face this idea of how are we going to find our safety if we allow this to be in the world in a bigger way? And when we learn about extreme atrocities, it can be distressing. And what you should know is, uh, what I believe, and according to the work of Stephen Porges about uh, uh, the threat response, we naturally go into a flinch response. That's how we're designed. And that's good. That's our conscience. So we need to learn about how the threat response works so that if we think, oh my gosh, this is overwhelming, the world is a horrible place, we find some ways to help calm down and remind ourselves that the entire world is not a horrible place. In fact, there's amazing places in this world, and in this room, and in our hearts. So this is going to be my cue, and I'm going to come back to it several times as I'm going through difficult places. <coughs> this is a beach in Hawaii that I absolutely love. So this is one of my outer safe spaces. I think we need inner safe spaces and outer safe spaces. And when we feel overwhelmed inside, we can bring back the recall of an outer safe space. And I can just pause. Imagine that safe space and how I feel when I'm there and the sound of the waves on the shore and the sand in my toes and the little kids laughing and you know playing in the waves. I mean it makes me it makes me touch just thinking about how much I love that place. It's a sacred place for me. And then when I recall it, it's right here. And we all have that capacity. And I think we need to use this skill when we're looking at atrocities. Otherwise we can really drown in the heaviness of So coming back to the nervous system and how it processes horror. First of all, it's good to know that shock, as I said, is a normal response. So if you're having that shock response at any time in this presentation, just know, yes, this is how I'm neurobiologically designed because I have a conscience. If we have extreme abuse in our background, there's a natural association to the inner experience that may not be fully processed, and that can evoke an even stronger effect threat response. So this is the trigger warning for the survivors in the room or if you have this in your family. Just know that you would have perhaps a bigger response. The sense of threat can rupture our security and send us into our sympathetic nervous system. So parasympathetic, we're calming down. Sympathetic, we're activated. And I want you to be somewhat activated. I, I don't want you to be falling asleep for this information. So there's a range where we want to be at. But if it goes too far, then it gets into dissociation, uh, and we don't want that. So just knowing that you know we mobilize in the case of threat, and that's that can be a powerful thing. Apathy in the face of extreme abuse is not good. <laughs> so we're trying to find that middle ground. We can also protect ourselves from the difficulty of processing this information by reframing the seriousness of it. This is the cognitive things that we do. So the information does not hurt as much, or at all. So we might deny it. Nope, there's no such thing as a free extreme abuse. She's making a big deal out of nothing. This is way smaller than she's saying that it is. Uh, you know, that doesn't really happen. Whatever we do, or shifting the blame, she's crazy. Mary Knight is a, a, a speaker here. She's a documentarian. She's making a, a, a film about, am I crazy? Are my memories, are they true? And you know, I think a lot of survivors have to answer that question for themselves. Am I crazy? These memories are crazy. But actually, the extreme abuse is what's crazy. So the memory of it is the healing process. And we do want to focus on you know, things that are reliable. But in general, watch, the, watch your brain. If you start to do that, you know, maybe I am crazy. But it also could be a way of trying to protect yourself from just how horrific this information is. Now, I'm, again, I'm not going to be going into my personal story today, um, but I am going to be teaching about the category of extreme abuse in more depth. However, there are many benefits. In addition to the threat response that our nervous system has, there are benefits that we can gain by learning and knowing the truth about extreme abuse and what it is. Well, relief and validation is one, especially if you're a survivor. 
oh, you know, the more I study this and the more I find ways of getting credible validation for my own experience, and people come to me and they say, oh my gosh, I knew that too. I had that too. I went to a therapist expert in extreme abuse and I told him some of the most extreme stuff in my story and he said, I've heard that exact same story from another client, down to the detail. And that was so validating. Now if I was back in denial that it ever happened and never went to see a specialist and never really talked about it, then I wouldn't have that relief and validation. But I think it's relief for just citizens who haven't gone through it too because we know there are things going on in our world that are horrible. But how do we frame them and what do we do about it? Healing the natural grief. If you're moving out of shock and denial, you can catalyze your anger and find take ragecations and deal with the ambivalence and the if onlys and get to the sadness and express it and become part of the solution more and more. If you learn about extreme abuse, you can have more empathy for people who have gone through it or yourself. You can do more acute clinical or criminal assessments because you'll start to recognize, for example, and say, oh yeah, I'm aware that in the extreme abuse survey, people who have ritual crimes against them may also have mind control. So I'm going to be on the lookout for that too. So the better assessment. Treatment uh, or service effectiveness. If you're a therapist offering treatment, you can f focus in on certain things that make uh, care in this kind of recovery more effective. And last but absolutely not least, you can join a growing community of courageous individuals, clinicians, etc., who are working to get at solutions. And you may know that there's been controversy in the therapeutic world about the reality of DID, recovered memories, whether extreme abuse exists. And in my mind, it's not going to be very long from now that that is going to be up in the past. We know too much about the science of memory and neurobiology, so people need to pick a team. <laughs> this is the team you want to be on, and it's where things are going, in my opinion. So I just encourage people to do your own research. You don't have to take anything I say at face value, but this is my recommendation. This is a good community of brave therapists and individuals, and they are the people you want to have your back in a time of crisis. I can tell you that some of the key leaders who have stood out in this movement of awareness around this have been isolated, shunned, persecuted, harassed, attacked, and they're still out there. So I, they have my respect. And so much of what I'm going to tell you today is based on their work and their scholarship. So how do we process horror? The way out is through. We need to remember that righteous anger is a natural neurobiological response when humans see harm to innocence and honor. And that's very important. That's based on the work of Stan Tatkin. He wrote a book called Wired for Love. And he is a great teacher about how it is healthy for us to get mad and outraged sometimes. And when we do that, it can mobilize us into taking some action. Now, if we stay stuck, then we can have chronic resentment, and that's very bad. That's an inflammation response, and we all know inflammation is not good for our systems. But if we can find a way to express it and release it in a constructive way, then we have a, a, a calming effect. It's very good for our immune systems. So protection and kind of uh, movement is good for us. So I'm going to switch into this concept of trauma, trauma-informed care. Now that's the theme of this whole conference, trauma-informed care. And I recently read an article called The Call for Universal Trauma Training, published in the American Academy of Experts in Traumatic Stress. And they teach about what trauma is, and they're saying, this is a big deal, folks. This affects people beyond which we have ever yet realized. And we need to look at this in a public health context, context and we need to train therapists about it. And I wholeheartedly agree. However, the way that they defined this trauma typically comes into three categories. And it's not just this. This is a lot of people when they teach about trauma, they use these three categories or, or similar ones. And so what do they talk about? They say single incident shock trauma. That's your classic big T trauma people say. You had a big car accident, you're shaken up, you've been traumatized. And you can get PTSD from one incident. Then there's the next category is often looked at as developmental, happens in childhood, relational, 
uh, betrayal trauma, this is your loved ones, they're struggling with addiction, they're betraying you, it happens over your lifespan, so it's very much part of who you are, and that can be looked at, I call it chronic way of life trauma. And some people refer to that as little t trauma, and I think in a way because it's hard to see, harder to see that little t than the big t. But I don't like that term little t. I actually think this should be giant t, <laughs> because this is really so in, intertwined in how we, who we become, whatever happens to us as children. And so it's, it's a massive effect on all kinds of things. And I'll be talking more about that in the, uh, this afternoon, addiction as one of those symptoms. And then the last category is kind of like a catch-all bucket for all other kinds of trauma. So some people put complex here, but other people put it here, complex trauma, Historical, intergenerational, violence, war, immigration, national disasters. It's like everything else. So where is extreme trauma on here? That's my problem. In my opinion, something is n missing from this. Because this is too important to have as a catch-all category or some kind of amalgam. Uh, and I think we need to differentiate it from the other kinds of traumas that are classically talked about from traumatologists and trauma specialists. So. I think most of us, as I've mentioned before, we, we've come to accept that genocide is real. And if you don't think it's real, I can give you a list of 12 genocides that are widely known about. Um, slavery is accepted, but it's often a thing of a, of a past. Um, human labor and sex trafficking, which is a sense a modern day version of slavery. Okay, we know that's happening. We've got some ads on the sides of buses in Seattle. We're like, okay, that's happening out there somewhere. Probably other countries mostly is typically what people think. We know we have a problem in the media. I think most people would agree that child rape exploitation media is widely available, it's a big shadow culture, it's a problem. And uh, reliable statistics or, or numbers on that come from Patrick Carnes, the guy who Dr. Donald Hilton, talk about porn, the porn industry as a 100 to 320 billion dollar annually a year industry. But there's no data on the child rape porn because it's so taboo and horrific. Nobody's out there you know, making census surveys of it. Uh, or if they are, I don't have it down, I guess I'll put it that way. So, but we, we know that happens. We don't like that it happens, but we know it happens. And then most people have heard stories about abusive cults. Like just, I think today in the Atlantic, there's a video out on, on another uh, cult exposure. So, so we kind of have in our framework, but for a lot of us, it's, it's over there. And let me tell you, if I wasn't a survivor and dealing with these things in my own life, it would be over there for me too. But it's here, so again, let's talk about it. I believe a category of abuse is needed to describe the experiences that some survivors go through. It goes beyond what's lumped in with the complex. What is that? Let's call it extreme abuse trauma. What is that? Well, I'm going to take the work of the extreme abuse survey and just stretch it out a little, uh, and say that there's four characteristics of extreme abuse as I am defining it. What are those characteristics? One, it is calculated, systematized, and secret, and involves secret abuse of children. And when I'm talking about systematized, I'm talking about massively organized, networked. And what I mean by that is like like what you see in a corporation, a mainstream non-abuse corporation like Amazon.com, or the United Parcel Service. They have planes, they have a whole internet system. So I'm looking at it at that level of scope. I'm also talking about extreme abuse that is depraved and abhorrent in nature. And in fact, the depravity of the crimes protect perpetrators from discovery by relying on what I've taught you about your human flinch response, your human recoil from horror. And then in fact, that becomes a cloak that they hide behind because you do not want to know this stuff. Or that's what your nervous system tells you because we're naturally wired to say, ugh. Next, I define extreme abuse as when cunning and brutal means are used to control and silence the victims <coughs> of it. And this is key if you're treating people who survived it because they would have experienced this cunning brutal means. This includes forced or coerced perpetration and blame shifting, and that is a key way that survivors are kept silent. 
they are forced or coerced into participating in some kind of horrific act, and then they're told it's their fault. They did it, they're a horrible person, and if they ever tell, then they're going to the police. Or, uh, cunning and brutal means is, if they ever tell, everyone they know will be murdered, they will be murdered, tortured, etc. But <coughs> there's more, it's more than just telling. They actually have showing, in other words, they do things to kids to instill these beliefs, uh, horrific acts. So I'll be referring to those. I won't give you an example, but there's many people in the room who I believe our survivors are very knowledgeable about this, and they're nodding. They're going, yep, yeah, we get it. Yeah, we've been there. The last category or characteristic of extreme abuse, as I'm defining it, is when relentless methods to the point of extortion and murder are used to prevent exposure and a criminal accountability. So number three is what they do at the time of the abuse to keep sufferers silent. Number four is what they do when people start to speak out about it. So it may sound similar, but there's some overlap. They use relent relentless methods. And so this is effective. I'll be offering some more examples of how this happens as we go. So. In addition to saying we need to look at extreme abuse as a separate category of trauma or of the kinds of trauma people suffer, I also want to take the two categories that were added in the extreme abuse survey, the ritual abuse of mind control, and I want to add a third category of that just to reflect modern reality and, and just my understanding of a wider scope. And so I'm also changing the language a little bit from the, the previous language of ritual abuse and mind control. I'm just, that, so you'll see, um, because those words are shocking and in some ways they're just so infused with disinformation and propaganda that they're almost meaningless in some circles. So the extreme abuse trifecta, as I would like to define it, includes three things. Pedophile porn rings, and that's kind of a new angle. Occult themed abuse, which is another way of looking at ritualized abuse, and DTTBD, aka mind control programming. So, you know, nothing, nothing's really real unless you have an acronym for it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that stands for uh, a deliberate trauma or technology, technologically based dissociation. And I know it's a mouthful, forgive me, but I'll explain in more detail about what it is. And the reason I'm choosing these words is I'm trying to describe what it is and not make like something that stands for something else. I'm just trying to describe what actually happens in the terminology to help people process it more easily. So I'm sure this can be improved upon, but this is what I got. So before we go into more examples, let's go back to the beach. <laughs> <laughs> for you, even if we're thinking about things that are awful, that nothing is happening right now in this moment, in this room. And for me, what I would say is I'm safe, I'm loved, I'm protected. And we'll go forth and talk about pedophile porn rings. So I'm going to teach you about pedophile porn, pedophile porn rings kind of mouthful in three categories. Brain likes categories, the left brain. First category is the bad. And the second, just so you know where I'm headed with this, is the worst, and the third is the catastrophic. So let's start with the bad of pedophile porn rings. This is what most people see when they think of pedophile porn rings, this particular case. The modern face of the pedophile porn ring, this is from September 4th, 2004. Uh, 15, one year ago, a man and a woman were charged as the San Francisco Examiner mainstream <coughs> news. They found a thumb drive that contained hundreds of images and videos. And this is the horrific part. On the videos, they saw children being molested as, well, as young as one year old. So we go, oh, that's such a horrible, I don't even want to think about that, right? There's the natural human threat response. Ugh. As a result of this investigation, though, looking into trying to make a difference, criminal justice, five minors were taken into protective custody. Mm -hmm. So the, knowing about it, looking at it, now this was, these were two people, and then they were connected to two people in the UK. 
So according to the story, these two people were coercing the people in the UK to, to uh, commit child abuse. And then they were also uh, accessing minors online and coercing those minors into sending naked pictures of themselves. And the coercion is the kind of the force of it. And so this is a ugh, you know modern pedophile porn ring, and that's awful. And I don't want to minimize that. But it goes much deeper than that. So this is a worse example of a pedophile porn ring. Here we are in Scotland, Operation Matisse. Now this is June, July 2016. So this is not old information. This was an investigation a little over a month. It involved the collaboration of 134 separate investigations. We're talking about not four people in two countries now. We're talking about horrific acts. Almost 400 charges were brought in this, although that was just at the time of the news story. So what are the charges? This is what happens in a pedophile porn ring. So the criminal charges brought against these perpetrators included rape, sharing indecent images of children, grooming for sexual purposes, sexual extortion, indecent communication with children, possession of a firearm, so uh, uh, bestiality, which is another horrific involving animals and sexual abuse, and drugs offenses. So this was going on, and the constable um, in charge of the case spoke up and basically said, ongoing, large-scale, complex, increasingly global, evolving threat. So this is the case of the worst level of the fall corner. And I already went over that. Oh, so another just tough thing about this case is one computer found that featured 10 million images depicting child abuse. So this isn't a thumb drive with hundreds of images. Now we're going to 10 million images on one computer. So just so I'll just say right now, I've got chills. So my, my nervous system is having a threat response because I my logical brain can grasp the difference between 100 images. I can't really grasp 10 million, but I know it's a lot. And so I'm getting this, uh, you know, revulsion response. I need to drink some water and just say, why am I learning about this? Why am I here in this room? Why am I watching this video? For a noble purpose. Because those are people on that computer. So the next example of a worse pedophile porn ring than four people in two countries comes from Europol's Operation Daylight. Massive European Online Child Abuse Network Exposed. This is August 2016. What about Operation Daylight? Well, in this statement, this is a determined investigator. He's not stuck in denial. He's working on it. Uh, Italian police said that all the suspects had no previous criminal activity and were classified as above suspicion. So this is just the Italian branch of the investigation. So instead of seeing the two kind of rough looking angry people in their orange jumpsuits, now this the perpetrators of this crime are people who are all about 50 and they're, they're uh, above suspicion. So, wow, this, what's, what's this? This is different. According to the police, using everyday programs like Skype, chat, live stream, pornography of children was sold. Offenders used sophisticated encryption methods to hide their activities on the so called dark net. If you haven't heard of darknet, it's like a whole separate internet. This is a notorious online network where illegal activities commonly take place. And to perpetrate this, they used online currencies like Bitcoin to pay the activities. So remember I told you about the scope of this being much bigger. And the organization being like Amazon.com or United Parcel Service. Well, Amazon.com kind of dominates the internet, right? I mean, you can everything you buy, you just get there, and they deliver it in a day, I and mean, it's amazing. Well, pedophile porn rings basically have their own internet. So they don't dominate the internet, although there's a lot on the regular internet. They have their own internet. It's much more encrypted, much more hard to track people down. And they also have their own currency, Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is being mainstream more and more, so you can see it in some mainstream businesses. But actually, a primary use of it is because it can't really be traced very easily. I'm going to hold questions until the end. Yeah, thank you. But definitely do some more research on that. There's a big Time Magazine article about the dark net and Bitcoin, so you can, you can check that out if you want to know more. So now we're going to go to a story of the catastrophic level of a pedophile porn ring. And then we'll go back to the beach. 
1998, U.S. federal agencies raided and shut down Nebraska's Franklin Community Credit Union after it was revealed that $40 million went missing. So this is in the United States. What initially looked like a financial swindle soon exploded into a startling tale of drugs, money laundering, and a nationwide child sex abuse ring. It made the front page of the Washington Times. <coughs> There's links to the White House. Tom Brokaw did a brief story on it. The momentum in the news was growing, and more and more reports were coming in. In fact, including some reports that there was some high-level people involved, and the key investigator on the case was en route to deliver some of those names when his plane that he was driving or uh, piloting with his eight-year-old son crashed. Gary Cowher Dory and his eight-year-old son died suddenly and violently. He was the Legislative Committee's chief investigator. A dozen others linked to the Franklin case died strange and mysterious deaths. Do you remember what I said about brutal means to keep people silent when things start coming out, up to the point of extortion and murder? Is this why you've never heard of the Franklin cover-up? even though it's catastrophic and in the United States. Now, there are people who wrote books about this. It didn't go completely missed. One of the books was written by an investigative journalist, Nick Bryant. Another was written by a United States Senator, John DeCamp. But it's not why they reported in the news. In 1993, a film crew from Yorkshire Television in the UK had heard about this story, and they said, this is a story. They went to Omaha, Nebraska in the United States to make a documentary about the alleged pedophile ring connected to the Boys Town Charity in <coughs> Omaha, Nebraska. Funded by the Discovery Channel in the US, their proposed firm would be the first to broadcast in the UK and Ireland, and then a US broadcast would follow on the Discovery Channel. In Omaha, the film crew discovered machinations of a vast operation functioning throughout the country, providing children to the wealthy and the drug and the political establishment for molestation, drug, tra drug trafficking, and blackmail. A year later, in 1994, the documentary Con Conspiracy of Silence was uh, to air in the UK, but during the final editing, with the first broadcast approaching, the Discovery Channel inexplicably withdrew support and reimbursed Yorkshire Television the half million dollars the film took to make. To this day, the documentary re remains unofficially or officially unaired, but it was leaked in a rough, rough cut made available on YouTube. So you can see this on YouTube, but it made no mainstream news. In my mind, this is a catastrophic situation that has never been properly investigated, reported upon, or uh, prosecuted. So, what do I do about that? <laughs> I try to calm down because my neurobiology feels outraged. And I feel that the innocence of those children and the honor of the investigator and other people who died as mysterious deaths who were just trying to investigate something that is a story. But there are moments where I can't do anything about that even though I do feel sad about that. My heart feels a lot of sadness about that. And this video is dedicated to those people that we lost. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, we each can ask ourselves, well, what can I do? And I'll talk more about that as we're getting to the end. So, just breathe in. <laughs> okay. And let's go on to a cult pain of abuse. So I want to talk about, this is better known as ritual or ritualized abuse, but those terms really scare people. Now, I heard from a key investigator who had lots of years of experience who said a lot of the people that he's found who are participating in this occult-themed abuse were not actually ideologically motivated. So I thought that was very interesting, and that's why I like the term occult-themed abuse, because there's, it's very specific. Now, occult just means hidden or secret, but in this way, I'm describing it as a very uh, concrete way of horrifying and terrifying, using things that are very effective in terrifying human beings, especially little tiny. 
so there's a difference in my definition between cult abuse and occult abuse. Cult abuse, this is again a mainstream news story published in, uh, uh, in June. And according to this story of cult-themed abuse, there were two women who told investigators they were among about 10 girls and young women who were chosen to live apart from their families in what was called the shepherd's camp. The abuse started at age 12 or so, and it continued through the early 20s. And investigators went in to take a look, and there was a man who was, in fact, perpetrating this, it looked like, using religious coercion and intimidation to maintain his control over them. So that's cult-themed abuse. Uh, they said there were other girls, but they weren't able to get people to come forward. So that's awful. But that's not what I'm talking about when I'm talking about occult-themed abuse. So I'm going to teach you about occult-themed abuse, actually using a case that's already been tried, prosecuted, and the person is found guilty. This case took place in Washington State, my home state, and it's the Paul Ingram case. Now, if you study this online, careful with your sources, because I found a lot of disinformation about this case online, as is the case in most occult-themed conversations. There's a huge variety of, of information out there, and much of it's very sensationalized. But I went to a conference called Organized Criminal Abuse in Childhood, taking a closer look, and I witnessed the, the prime investigator of this case, whose name is Neil McClanahan from the Thurston County Law Enforcement, and he had 35, 34 years with law enforcement, he was a decorated officer, and he took us step by step through this case and what happened. And it was beautiful, even though it was horrible. And he started with an apology to the victims of this case and to all victims of ritualized or occult being abuse. He said, we did not know. We would have listened to the victims more. If we had understood what we were dealing with, we had no clue. And that was very powerful for me to hear him make that apology and I pass that on to other survivors because there are law enforcement officers out there who are genuinely wanting to help. They just don't know. So in this case, however, there was a hypothetical complaint that was made about a high-ranking police officer in his same, well, at that point he didn't know. Someone came to me and said, what would you do, if, you know, what, would, what should someone do if they knew about a high-ranking police officer who's involved in horrific child abuse? And Neil McClanahan, because he's a good guy, said, well, you need to make a complaint, but not just to the law enforcement place that your guy's working at or whoever's perpetrating, make it to multiple agencies at the same time, well documented. And so it was a hypothetical complaint, but not long after that, sure enough, the complaint was made, and it came through and involved a police officer that he worked with. <coughs> so suddenly he's having to arrest his fellow police officer and, and, and question him. Well, the questioning led to an investigation and a guilty plea. So now we have a confession that was quite extensive about what actually happened in this case. However, because it was a cult fiend was involved in part of the abuse, there was a media frenzy and they called it satanic ritual Sorry, abuse. I miss that. <laughs> oh, someone felt good. Um, and there began to be all this massive lurid headlines in the case. And, and the news media actually caused chaos in the public and hampered the investigation. And he was saying, you know, we, we were just trying to investigate. We were dealing with our own shop. And then we're getting all these calls from media and people, you know, it's just, it was just a circus. So that's what happened in Thurston County with the Paul Ingram case. But the end result was there was a conviction of three times the penalty that was originally assigned. Ingram was sentenced to 20 years for child sexual assault of children. So what actually happened to, I mean, this was the man who was convicted was a 16-year veteran of the police force. He was a former Rep Republican Party a chair in Olympia. He's heavily involved in politics locally and statewide. He once ran for state representation, lost by just a little bit. So what did this very upstanding, appearing member of society confess to? Or, or what happened? What did the daughters, so the daughters, were the, his two daughters were the ones who came forward. Oh, I forgot to add, uh, Ingram appealed his case five times. So it kept going up and up and up and up, and he kept, his lawyers kept appealing. No, no, I didn't say that. I didn't mean it. I was coerced into confession. It's, it's not real. I didn't do it. And all five times he was convicted. 
So this was a rock solid case. This was not a travesty of justice that just happened in a backwater police department. So his daughters reported that, and so this is the horror of occult themed abuse. In the middle of the night, they would be brought outdoors or indoors and used in ceremonies with horrific abuse, raped by several perpetrators, men, women with the dildo. They were defecated on, so this starts to like, wait a minute, that's beyond what we typically see with child abuse, right? Uh, they were given an animal, a puppy, or a kitten to bond to. Kids fall in love very easily. Then the animal was killed in a ceremony, and the victims were told it was their fault the animal had died. This was conditioning to them to the organized ritual abuse system of secrecy. So remember I talked about the forced perpetration, the coercion. So he'd never heard of my definition. But these are the similar kinds of stories that are told from people all over the world who report involvement in ritualized or occult themed abuse. Now, why is that? I mean, maybe it's because people are just horrible and they do horrible things, but I actually think my logic brain tells me it's very effective in keeping secrets. Hmm. And people who commit crimes don't want to be caught. They're not all stupid. So this is what Neil said about the abuse. What else did he say? And more horror here. Okay, so just tune in your body and just breathe. One daughter reported that Paul, the father, impregnated her and she was later examined by a doctor who deemed her as medically evident to have been pregnant. So the police found a reputable doctor, though there was no baby. Paul Ingram said the baby was taken away by an abortion. So he confessed. He impregnated his daughter. There was a baby. It was taken away. He said it was taken by an abortion clinic in Sheldon, Washington. But when the investigators did their research, they found there were no places doing abortion in Sheldon, Washington. But the daughter's testimony is that the baby was taken in a ritualized ceremony. And that the mother, Sandy, at first was involved, but later uh, that she was not involved, but later she did prepare the children for the rituals, though she did not participate in them. So the, the mom was complicit, according to what the daughter said. So this is something that is very awful to think about and horrific, but this is what the daughter said in the case. So the conclusion of Neil McClanahan is that this form of abuse is by design. Physical, emotional, psychological, spiritual, and sexual to horrifically traumatize individuals and keep them from revealing who was guilty of the crimes, hiding in plain sight, no one will believe. When they try to escape the abuse and reveal the secrets, their credibility is attacked. You're saying Satan abused you? Are you crazy? They are conditioned to believe that no one will believe them. So, I asked Neil McClanahan in the questions and answers if this kind of occult-themed abuse was against the law in Washington State. Now, abuse of various kinds that are perpetrated in the occult systems is, is abused. But I was asking, is it specifically uh, uh, against the law to do this kind of abuse? Because doesn't this seem like an added kind of abuse? A, a puppy and a kitten? poop and I mean all that ugh, natural ugh, ugh, stuff and he said no it's not illegal in Washington State and that was part of their problem they, they, were, they, they didn't know how to sort it all out and so all, but they just focused on the child sexual abuse and that's what they got the conviction for but there are two two states uh, in the in the country in the United States that occult themed abuse or ritualized abuse is illegal so just two but it's there. It's on the books in two states, uh, Idaho and Illinois. So what does the law say in Idaho and Illinois that you cannot do? You cannot, uh, you're guilty of ritualized abuse if you do this. Um, you can't torture, mutilate, or sacrifice a warm-blooded animal or human being. I mean, isn't it bizarre this has to be a law? But I think it's even more bizarre that it happens and it's not a law in all the states. You cannot force ingestion, injection, or other application of narcotic drug, hallucinogen, anesthetic for the purpose of dulling sensitivity, cognition, recollection, or resistance to any criminal activity. You can't drug people. Make them checked out. Manipulate them that way. But make them forget. Force ingestion, again, more horror, external application of animals, uh, urine, feces, flesh, blood, body, bones, body secretion, non-prescribed drugs, chemical com compounds. Now, why is this a law? Because it's happened. It's happening. It's a global issue. But, well, who wants to look at it? 
You can't involve a child in a mock, unauthorized, or unlawful marriage ceremony with another person or representation of any force or deity, followed by sexual contact with the child. Okay. So, yuck. And how overwhelming for a child. I, I'll just take a moment. You know, we're going to go back to the beach pretty soon. I'll just finish this law. <laughs> And, you know, I, again, I was just listening to Mary, and she was talking about the church-controlled human trafficking, and, and she was talking about her own experience. And it, she, she talked about being placed in a coffin with a dead body. That's illegal. You can't place a child in a coffin or open grave containing a human corpse or remain. That happened to her. She was just talking about that. Um, threatening death or serious harm to a child, their parents, family, pets, or friends that instills well-founded fear that the child threat will be carried out. The threat will be carried out. We can't do that in two states. You cannot unlawfully dissect, mutilate, or incinerate a human corpse. A corpse. So, so this is what occult-themed abuse typically looks like. It takes the regular abuse, and then it adds this other level that creates incredible horror, just overwhelm, just kind of blows people away in shock easy to repress or, or never process these kinds of memories because you can see how much difficulty you're having just you know, paying attention in the room. And this is just me talking about it. <sighs> uh. So, let's take a moment. <laughs> <laughs> just for space. And you just flip it back so I can get the name of the book and the author. See. Oh, yes, possible? yes, yes. So this is from Safe Passages to Healing, a Guide for Survivors of Ritual Abuse. It's by Christine Oksana. And she's the one that chronicled the, the law. So it's, it's a wonderful book if you are wanting to learn more about ritualized or occult themed abuse or survivor. Thank you. You are welcome. So I'm just going to take a moment and pause and kind of focus within, find that safe space. I may need to remind myself of my attempt for a noble purpose here. Why am I doing this? Why am I making myself feel so horrible right now by exposing myself to this? Well, I want to be part of the solution. This is a team effort. I'm really grateful this room is full. I'd love there'd be just a few people here, maybe my family. <laughs> So I'm just so grateful and honored that so many people came out to hear this presentation because it takes guts, right? The visceral nervous system, that the one, the, the reptilian reactions to horror, but the positive side of that is amazing resilience, and that is really the beauty of this whole thing: is people survive it, they live to tell, and they live to make a difference, and it's amazing. So, in some ways, this is a testimony to horror, but it's also a testimony to human resilience. Mm -hmm. so, deliberate trauma or technolo technology-based dissociation. What is this? Better known as mind control. Now, this is the stuff often of sci-fi. I cannot tell you how many movies right now, television themes, have a theme of mind control. If you think you haven't heard of mind control, just look up mind control in movies, and you will find a list miles long. Hollywood is really into mind control right now. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. But nobody knows about it. Mm. Or do they? What is it? Okay, so I'm making up this thing to call it deliberate trauma or technological based association, calling it what it is. Mm. What is that? Well, it actually involves three steps. It's, it's simple. I have a, a more complicated definition, but I'm just going to stick with the simple. How do you control someone's mind? Can you do that and how do you do that? Well, yes, you can. Not everyone, perhaps, but they've gotten people who, who the criminals who perpetrate mind control, uh, they they have very sophisticated methods that have been going on for quite some time and developing. And so here's what how it works. First, uh, they isolate and restrain someone, usually a child. Children are much easier to manipulate in this way <coughs> than adults because their their core identities are not so formed. And then. They shock. They use trauma to shock them and split them from their core conscience. Or they use technology. And I'll be giving definitions about, or, or examples about how they do that. So first you isolate and restrain someone, and then you absolutely overwhelm their consciousness. So the threat response kicks in, and they can't connect to anyone. They're isolated. They can't 
fight or flight, run away, and so they dissociate. So their conscious mind dissociates, which maybe some of you are doing or wanting to do right now just to get away from thinking about this presentation. But for kids, let me tell you, they check out and they go to a safe place, like maybe floating on the ceiling. So we know dissociation happens and it's a way of dealing with overwhelming threat. Well, so do perpetrators. So that's what they do. And then what do they do when someone is scrambled and really easily influenced or manipulated in the consciousness of post-trauma or the use of this technology? Then they insert intrusive commands called programs. And those commands then run from the inside. They also do things to reinforce the programs. So I'll <coughs> offer some examples of programs that are used after people are isolated and shocked and traumatized and they are very suggestible. <coughs> but first I want to talk about why. Why would someone do this? And again, just looking at the left brain logic, why does someone do this? Is it because the whole world is a horrible place and there's people out there that are just awful? Well, I don't think the whole world is a horrible place, but I think people do awful things. And there's reasons, actually very logical reasons. So why, what are common uses for people who've been uh, tampered with in this way, and have been enslaved from the inside of the world, deliberately dissociated? Well. They might be used in drugs or gun or weapon running. So people who have been deconscienced, in other words, isolated from their, their thinking cognitive capacities to make choices through mind control or through this deliberate trauma or technological based association, they're much more likely to participate in criminal activities because their conscience is offline. So they might be willing to do drug or gun or weapon running. They might be willing to be involved in prostitution or sex trafficking networks, including of children, like we talked about those pedophile porn rings. Guess what? People have to run those. They don't run themselves. Billion dollar industries, or you know, however much money running through. They might be involved in creation and distribution of child pornography. Also the pedophile porn ring, very active, aka child abuse photos. There is a lot of money in that. They might be involved in political, military intelligence, covert operations, be used as couriers, be used for blackmail. They might be used as interrogators, torturers, and assassins. They might be used to carry out destructive abuse in, or abuse in destructive networks with religious or other uh, agendas. So, That's the why. When you can have someone and you manipulate them in this way, you can use them in your networks to do awful things. And they don't have the same kind of resistance that people who have their consciences intact do. And you know, as horrible as this is to think about, and it's going to be more horrible a little bit because I'm going to tell you how they do it, in my mind, this is a testimony to the power of the human conscience that people would have to go to such extreme, extraordinary matter, measures to separate humans from it. So I think that's helpful to keep in mind when you think about it. If people were e easily manipulated into hurting one another, we wouldn't have to go through such extreme measures. So these are some effective traumatic measure, uh, methods to deliberately dissociate people. It's a long list. And we'll check our time here. Yeah, we're getting close to the end. So I'm not going to go through and read the whole list. You can just take a look. There's a lot, and it's awful. And it's very effective. So again, if you want to have a copy of this presentation, just sign up on my email list, and I'll send it to you. But these are the traumas, the shocks. These are technological methods. So these are, I mean, not always they involve technology as we think of it. But these are typically, they're not quite as shock-inducing, or they can be, but they also, but they also cause the split. Um, and people who use this kind of uh, science on humans use a combination. It's not just one or the other. They use very effective combinations, and they do what works. So Common programs deliberately instilled, especially when someone's in a scrambled, vulnerable, dissociated state. Do not remember what we've done to you. Do not tell anyone. 
of your normal at all costs so you don't give us away. If you start to remember, you will self-injure, or you will be accident prone, or you will kill yourself, or you will harm or kill others. You have to report back to us so you can't get away. You have to return to us if we give you certain cues. And they reinforce the conditioning over and over. And you can't go to see a therapist. Or if you do, because you're going to start to remember, so you have to self-sabotage. So there's some very sophisticated methods that will prevent these folks from remembering or telling. But, so back to the trifecta here. Pedophile porn rings, microphone programming, cult themed abuse. There's lots of overlap when this happened for people. And I think we need a separate category of extreme abuse trauma to define it because it's, it's just not like everything else. So here you go. I presented my truth to you in an overview. <coughs> it will set you free for glorious dining, but first it will piss you off. <laughs> I hope you are feeling some measure of outrage. And at the same time, perhaps some of the other qualities like, okay, we got it out, we're talking about it. Maybe you're feeling relief that we're almost done. Uh, I'll close with this. How do we handle our outrage? Well, I want to show you what they did in Belgium. So in Belgium, they had a child sex scandal. Looks like a pedophile porn ring. It's being aimed at one specific person, Mark Dutroux. But there was a lot of evidence that there was a lot more people involved. And I'm just going to summarize. You can uh, see a lot more. There's a show called, uh, well, this video footage is taken from a show, a real crime show. But the bottom line, this is a New York Times story. So it's not, you know, this is a credible news source, we hope. Um, in Brussels, that there was um, a pedophile porn ring that seemed to be operating. There were kids that were being kidnapped. There's some kids that were murdered. The investigation was going on. It was going to higher and higher levels. In other words, it looked like it was going to start to involve more people. Um, and then the uh, investigation started getting shut down. Uh, let's see. At, at one point, there was a magistrate who was taking it seriously and was really getting somewhere, and it looked like they were going to release some names. And Connor Red was the name of the magistrate, and he was uh, removed. And the people thought they were getting somewhere, and suddenly he was taken off the case, and he was blamed for an ethical problem, which seemed to be totally trumped up. So um, at that point, people were already demonstrating what they felt was corruption on the case. But when the man who was looking to be a hero, that he was actually going to bring justice, was taken off the case, they erupted. This ruling prompted the public, already outraged, to march. However, they marched peacefully, which is what I would recommend. Um, <laughs> So I'm going to show you a video just in, in conclusion. We're running a little bit long, but we'll, we'll bring it to a close here. This is a brief video about the Marche of Marche. And I'll tell you, this is why I have the white balloons here. Mm -hmm. Because I'm so inspired by what the people of Belgium did. It's almost the 20 year anniversary of this march, actually, October 20th in Brussels. Mm -hmm. And uh, tens of thousands of people, well, it's, it, it, you'll, you'll see it for yourself. You can decide how many it looks like. Um, what you'll see in this video is an investigative journalist who's talking about the case. Uh, you will see uh, two girls who were kidnapped by what uh, by at least one person involved in the situation who were freed, um, and they are saying thank you in French. And then you're going to see the father of one of the girls who was uh, murdered. She was not. She did not make it. Her name is On, and he's talking about uh, something that happened on the day after the march. So here's the video of the Marche Blanche. And it's, oh, it's from a series called Real Crime, The Perverted World of Mark to True. Now, if you want all of these resources for what I use, the research, I have 25 handouts there, and I can get you more if you're on my email list if I run out. But if you want to investigate more for yourself, they're all on there, including the references to this whole video. So here it is. The situation in Belgium was like a, a revolution. Belgians took to the streets in protest. Workmen went on strike, and firemen turned their hoses on official buildings. The protest culminated in the biggest demonstration since the Nuremberg rallies, the White March. White to represent the innocent of the children. I think it was the biggest manifestation ever 
there were no posters in, in, in the streets to say you go to Brussels that day for the right match. It was a word that was spread amongst Belgians. There wasn't even much publicity on, on radio and television. Everybody knew that they had to be there. There were more than 300,000 people marching through the streets of Brussels. Someone wrote a letter and put it on the grave of Anne the day after the White March. And he wrote and he said, Anne, it was a good day yesterday. And we saw your father for, for the first time again laughing. And that's the truth, it was that feeling. The people had united in their thousands against a Belgium they felt was rotten to the core. The protests were too great to be ignored. In an attempt to appease them, a parliamentary committee was set up to examine the police investigation and the secretive Operation Othello. It concluded that the structure of the police system needed to be reformed. While they had found no evidence of corruption, the true had profited from their incompetence. To me, the, the crucial sentence in the final report of the, the Parliamentary Commission was there are so many errors, so many mistakes during this investigation that it can't be explained only by a uh, mistake. There must be more. Um, I encourage you to learn more and share more. There's other conferences you can attend. Obviously, this Ivory Gardens conference is a key place to learn information. Uh, my friend Trish Fotherham is a survivor and advocate, and she has a quote I absolutely love when I try to hold the whole picture of extreme abuse and not be overwhelmed. And she says, no baby is born evil. And I truly believe that. It's not how I was raised in the church I was raised in, but I believe it to be true, that no baby is born evil. People are made that way, and especially in some of this deliberate dissociation. So when we're looking at justice, we have to figure out new ways to find justice. So if you want to know more, again, or get a copy of this video as after it's produced, you can um, sign up on my email list. I, it might be going around. Oh, Somewhere? Here. Here? Okay. So grab that. And again, there's some handouts. I also have some handouts about therapists who are familiar with treating extreme abuse in the local area. So um, you might want that too. Are these two different? Yeah. They are two different. Okay. Yeah. One's the therapist and then one's the okay. just more research research uh, or research options for you to check out more information. This is just the overview. So thank you again for your time. Thank you for being here.